All right. Well, I hope you are all doing well. I am going to dive into the meat um, of this evening program. Welcome. Um, this is the 2022 Dorothy Moulter Museum virtual gathering webinar. I'm Jess Edberg, the executive director here, and I'm grateful for all of you being here with us tonight and to be, um, I'm very proud to be the host of this evening's program. So sit back, get comfortable, um, and I hope you enjoy yourselves. This program, like I mentioned, will be recorded. Um, it'll be available on our YouTube channel at a later time once we can process the video. And you're welcome to share it with any friends or family perhaps that weren't able to make it today or if you wanted to rewatch it yourself. Um, perhaps you'll be the winner of our canoe raffle and you want to just you know keep watching me pulling it out of the hat for you. Tonight, um, I have a couple questions for you to get us rolling. Um, I am curious how many of you are dressed in your favorite plaid? So you should be seeing a box pop up and I am asking everybody to select um, if you are or are not wearing your favorite plaid. It looks like <laughs> quite a few people are uh, leaving the room for a moment and uh, we'll be coming back to uh, join us once they get their plaid back on. And of course, pajamas count because it's anonymous and nobody can see you. So who's gonna know? Nobody's gonna know. One other question that I'd like to ask everybody is how many of you attended last year, the webinar that we were having? All right, so it's about, half and half ish emphasis on the ish um, so as you can see about half of you didn't make it um, or weren't aware that it was going on so we're glad that you're here tonight um, i'm excited to to share a little bit about dorothy Moulter, um, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit of something too while you're here so if you're new to Zoom, um, if you're on a computer smart device, um, although I'm excited to see everybody's faces, I believe most people have um, already turned off their video. If you haven't, I encourage you to do that now, as well as your microphone. It'll definitely improve the quality of video on your end, um, and it'll cut down on background noise for everybody else if your mic is off. I'll also ask to, um, if you'll limit the other devices in your home that are using your internet resource. Um, that'll also give you a better quality image um, of the slideshow and um, me talking to you from your lower corner there. Unless, of course, you are bidding on our silent auction. Now, if you have not been following it, uh, we are currently running an online silent auction fundraiser. It ends tonight at 8 p.m. And so my goal is to finish a little bit early so that you folks can have a chance to go and either check it out or get those last minute bids in before it closes. We have a variety of auction items, most of which are shippable. And we're incredibly fortunate um, and grateful for the generosity of the financial sponsors that we have and the auction donors that have made this event possible and so successful. The last time I checked before the webinar, we were nearing 95% toward our goal of raising $5,000 for the Dorothy Moulter Museum. So if you have an opportunity, uh, we encourage you to acknowledge or thank the businesses, organizations, and individuals um, that have supported the museum in this endeavor. When the auction closes, you'll be notified by 32auctions.com if you um, win an item that you have been bidding on. And then myself and staff will be processing everything over the weekend to either ship out early next week if you've selected shipping or have it available here at the museum for pickup and or payment if you choose not to pay online. We are open tomorrow, Friday and Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so we'll work really hard tomorrow morning to get everything ready for pickup. If this weekend doesn't work for you, uh, we are more than happy to arrange another day or time for you to, to pick up items. We'd love to hear from you during the event. I have Alyssa Nelson with 
this evening as another host. Alyssa is the program head for the Wilderness and Park Management Program um, over at Vermilion Community College and is also a board member here at the Dorothy Moulter Museum. She is going to be moderating the question and answer um, area and make sure that if she's unable to answer or address questions that we touch base with them towards the end of the program. So we will take some time towards the end to address um, questions that you might have. But if you haven't done this before and you'd like to, to type in a question so that you don't forget it, um, down in the lower taskbar of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A button. If you press that, um, you should get a little text box that comes up and then you can type in a question or comment and we'll save those and make sure that everything's addressed. And if we miss somebody or we don't get to a question um, by the time we, we end the program tonight, I'll make sure to personally reach out and email folks that have any further questions. And if you have questions after the program that you think of, um, feel free to email me. It's jess at rootbeerlady.com. And that goes for folks that might be joining us tonight via their telephone um, because we can't offer the same resources of Q&A uh, that we can with using a computer or smart device. One other item of business, since I have hopefully your undivided attention right now, is that we're currently working on the first print newsletter that we have put out since the pandemic started. So winter of 2019, 2020. And we wanna make sure that we have all of the correct contact information for our members. Um, so if you are a member and you have not received any postal mail from us um, in the last year to, a, to two years, um, touch base with me just to make sure that I have your mailing address. I know that I have um, touched base with a few of you just to be sure. Or if you're not a member and you would like to become a member so that you can get that print newsletter, um, I can help you with that or you can go to rootbeerlady.com and go to our web store and become a member. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that if you have unsubscribed from our email list, that means that we can't send you museum updates, invitations, special discounts, or other member only um, information. And we totally understand if your email inbox is um, full of tons of solicitations, uh, but we just want to make sure that you're aware if you've unsubscribed, we cannot continue to send you emails from our database system. So you can always resubscribe or reach out and let me know and we can get you back um, on that system. All right, now with the uncertainty of where the pandemic would play out this winter, the museum's board and staff had to make a decision several weeks ago on whether or not we were gonna offer an in-person dinner or if we were gonna to decide to go back to a virtual program. And obviously we decided to um, stay on the, the more conservative end and out of a, an abundance of caution chose to do virtual. Um, we didn't wanna risk having a dinner canceled last minute or having really low registration. And today up in Ely, we've got some really snowy weather and driving would have been kind of challenging. So um, overall, having this virtual program um, has shown to be the best choice for us to make right now. And so tonight we gather the best way we can to honor and to remember a beloved Northwoods icon and historical figure, Dorothy Moulter. Now this past year at the museum was leaps and bounds better over 2020 in so many ways. Um, one big one was our visitation was our second highest visitation on record, just behind 2018, which was the museum's 25th anniversary celebration season, where we had a wide variety of celebratory events um, and record-breaking admissions, which for the museum here was about 6,100 people from our opening day in May to our closing day at the end of October. Um, and it seems like folks are really itching to get out and about. Um, we are incredibly thankful that people chose to invest their leisure time here at the Dorothy Moulter Museum and to invest their vacation dollars in our gift shop. And generally, it was the root beer that people walked out the door with most often. So I have a couple more polls that I'd like to uh, 
throw out there. And one is how many of you actually had one of Dorothy Moulter's original root beers up at the Isle of Pines? I did not. Um, I was uh, young when she passed and never was taken up to meet her. So sadly, I am a no. And it looks like only about 15% of our group here tonight has ever actually had a Dorothy Moulter root beer. And sadly, these numbers keep going down as time passes. Um, and so that's why the Dorothy Moulter Museum exists so that we can make sure that um, even if they never had one of Dorothy's or um, don't, didn't know what Dorothy's was, they still have an opportunity to learn about it. So if you haven't had one of Dorothy's original, which is the majority of us here tonight, how many of you have had one of the museum's modern version of Dorothy's root beer, Dorothy's Isle of Pines? All right, look at those numbers going up. Fantastic. So we have 84%. Now that 16% that has not had one of our modern versions, um, your time will come. And keep in mind that we do ship in the continental United States. So touch base with me after if you really, really want to get your hands on a bottle of that. So Dorothy, probably the most famous part of her story is her root beer. And there are many, many tales that come up here at the museum of people drinking her original bottle and what it meant to them. And it oftentimes will pique the interest of other visitors who then want to come and join the conversation and learn more about those experiences. And for some, it's the oral history or the yellowing photograph of a child's parent or grandparent that inspired them to seek out Dorothy's root beer in its modern form here at the Dorothy Moulter Museum. For many, many more, statistically speaking, it's the allure of tasting a small batch craft root beer with an obscure story in order to add it to a mental or physical list, keeping track of the many brands of root beer that one has been able to get their hands on. And there are a lot of them out there, the people and the root beers. And there has been an explosion of craft breweries here in the United States um, for more than the past decade. And a good chunk of those breweries also produce a non-alcoholic version for their patrons. And it's usually in the form of a root beer. So lots and lots of folks out there. Um, and, and me not knowing if this is a new phenomenon or this has always been there, but I've just kind of become more aware in the last few years of this underground culture of root beer enthusiasts. And the interest and dedication in root beer I've found ranges across a long and varied spectrum. And there are root beer drinking clubs, there are subscription packages, there are stores specifically for root beer, there are published guides and journals for keeping track and scoring the root beer that you have tried. There is root beer radio that I had the great pleasure of being on almost a year ago today and was welcomed by Dave Hurden and Matt Holton, who host a regular podcast discussing all things controversial in the world of root beer as they look and seek to find their best ever recipe of their own root beer. I had no idea that root beer could be controversial, but it is. And that's another show, probably not by me here at the museum. There's even a museum of root beer. It opened last summer in Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. It's the world's only public museum of root beer with interactive and educational exhibits, several collections, and they serve on tap root beer, a whole bunch of different kinds of root beer. And the root beer passion doesn't just end with what you can drink right now. There are multiple pages and groups on social media dedicated to the old time root beer brands that faded out such as Jackson or Silver Sierra or Pioneer or the more familiar Hires root beer. Collectors will pay kindly to get their hands on some of these brands crates, bottles or bottle caps. Why does root beer have such a following? What makes root beer so special? 
I don't know. And you're not going to get the answer from me tonight. But what I do know is that root beer is a uniquely American beverage. And perhaps that might be where some of the appeal comes from. In fact, root beer as we know it today originated here. Its roots lie with the indigenous cultures of the Americas. Root beer began as a humble tea, traditionally made using the root of one or two plants, sassafras or sarsaparilla, pronounced sarsaparilla in the United States. Don't ask me why. Both are believed to have medicinal value. Sassafras is a tree in the laurel family and is mostly native to the U.S. states east of the Mississippi River, southern Ontario and Canada, and in eastern Mexico. It's a medium-sized, moderately fast-growing aromatic tree that is little more than a shrub in northern areas like southwestern Maine or southern Ontario. But in the south, and particularly in the Great Smoky Mountains, the sassafras tree grows largest at 29, 25 to 39 feet, providing an important food for wildlife. Sarsaparilla is a single leaf stock member of the ginseng family. And it's probably the most familiar plant to root beer enthusiasts. It's just the most widespread. It's a perennial plant that's found in most provinces of Canada, over half of all United States, and in Mexico and Central America. It emerges in the springtime at the same time as poison ivy, so it's often misidentified because it also has shiny leaves like poison ivy does. Both sassafras and sarsaparilla were and are valued by indigenous peoples for a variety of medicinal properties, including treating gout, wounds, arthritis, coughs, fever, hypertension, and indigestion. And legend has it that in 1512, indigenous peoples introduced Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon to sassafras tree bark tea. And years later, the same happened to European immigrants who came over and settled on the continent. With sassafras tea popular for so many centuries, adding fermentation to the process resulted in the primitive version of root beer we have today with the simple addition of sugar and a probiotic starter such as yeast. Fermentation starts with glycolysis. During early stages of glycolysis, glucose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvic acid. Just kidding. We are not going on that deep of a dive into root beer and fermentation. This is the Dorothy Moulter Museum. We know root beer, but not that intimately. So take a deep breath. This isn't chemistry class. We're gonna move on with just the basics. Fermentation has been used for centuries for preserving foods, raising breads, and brewing drinks. And the beneficial bacteria or fungi used have been a major part of cultures since before recorded history. <laughs> I lost my control here when some chats were coming up. All right, there we go. We'll move it. There we go. The products of fermentation of sugar by baker's yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae, a fungus, are ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is what causes bread to rise and makes the bubbles in drinks. In short-term fermentation, such as when making root beer, the alcohol content typically remains very, very low, below, well below 2%. The tradition of brewing root beer is thought to have evolved out of a producing fermented drinks with very low alcohol content that could be substituted for possibly polluted drinking water sources. So if you think of all of those TV dramas of the ancient Roman times, they drink a lot of wine. I rarely see them drinking water. And if that's the case, it totally makes sense to me now. Now, these beverages were also thought to be healthier from the medicinal and nutritional qualities of the ingredients used. In addition to sarsaparilla and or sassafras, ingredients in early and 
Traditional root beers may have also included a variety of ingredients, including birch bark, coriander, juniper, ginger, wintergreen, burdock root, dandelion root, wild cherry bark, yellow dock, prickly ash bark, vanilla beans, and molasses. And that's not all. The commercialization of this beverage, though, seemed to take off like a wildfire in the mid 1800s. Root beer has been sold in candy stores since the 1840s and written recipes for root beer have been documented since the 1860s. It possibly was combined with soda water as early as the 1850s and root beer sold in stores was most often sold as a syrup rather than the ready-made beverage that we're used to having today. Now, Charles E. Hires was the first to successfully market a commercial brand of root beer. Hires developed his root tea made from sassafras in 1875, debuted a commercial version of root beer at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876, and began selling his extract. Hires never drank alcohol himself and wanted to call the beverage root tea. However, his desire to sell it to Pennsylvania coal miners caused him to name his product Root Beer, and he had a little bit more success with that. Hires began to bottle a beverage made from his famous extract in 1886, and by 1893, Root Beer was distributed widely across the United States. And this non-alcoholic version of Root Beer became commercially successful especially during prohibition, although it almost died. In 1895, the Women's Christian Temperance Union turned its sights on hires, partially because of the word beer in the name. Even though hires himself was a teetotaler, they thought there had to be some booze in it. For three years, the union was a pretty powerful force calling for a boycott of root beer and higher sales just went into the tank, even with his targeted marketing. Eventually, he got an independent lab to test his root beer's alcohol content, and the results arrived in 1898. Now, do you remember that other root beer flavoring from sarsaparilla? Well, one of Hire's early competitors was Barks in Mississippi, which began selling its sarsaparilla-based root beer in 1898 and was simply labeled Barks. Interestingly, just when it was proven that a bottle of root beer had the same alcohol content as a half a loaf of bread. Hmm. In 1919, Roy Allen revolutionized the enjoyment of root beer by serving his version of root beer in a cold frosty mug. His California brew led to the development of the A&W root beer franchise that we are all probably very familiar with. Eventually, cost savings and efficiency gave way to the development of artificial ingredients for commercially produced root beer and saw the decline of fermenting for carbonation and instead a shift to carbonated water. However, if you live on an island 15 miles from the nearest road to town, Fermenting is the only way to gain carbonation, most of the time. There are a number of recipes for homebrewing root beer, from using all natural ingredients to using all artificial ingredients. It just depends on how much effort you would like to put in to making it and the time you have to gather the ingredients, some of which could require harvesting from the landscape. Here in Minnesota, you'd be hard pressed to find sassafras unless you're willing to travel next door to Wisconsin, but wild sarsaparilla is quite common. According to VoyagerCountry.com, legend has it that a new drink was introduced to the northern Minnesota logging camps in the 1900s with the name sarsaparilla. It wasn't well received. The so-called beverage entrepreneurs changed the name to root beer and suddenly the loggers made a new connection with this drink and it became very popular overnight. It's an interesting parallel story to that of Charles Hires in Pennsylvania 
and I'm not aware of any connection with the story, but it's not uncommon for tales from one region to overlap to those of another region until it spreads across the country. For example, Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. Residents from Maine to Minnesota and on to California all claim Paul Bunyan was the one that they have in their state. We all know that Paul Bunyan is from Minnesota. And like other indigenous cultures of the Americas, Lake Superior Ojibwe or the Anishinaabe used smashed sarsaparilla roots for medicinal purposes, as well as for subsistence living by rubbing a mixture of sarsaparilla root and sweet flag root on their fishing nets as a fish attractant. Now for a woman living in a remote wilderness, Brainstorming ways to adapt to the new normal of public access management in the Superior Roadless area, foraging for bushels upon bushels of ingredients just wasn't practical. Once the flight ban of 1949 took effect and the independent pilots who protested this restriction were grounded in 1952, Dorothy could no longer import crates of soda pop to her resort, and she certainly wasn't going to portage them across all of the portages to get up there. So repurposing the hundreds of empty glass pot bottles she already had to use for home, homemade root beer seemed like a no brainer. And like the evolution of root beer itself, Dorothy's recipe changed over time. The availability of ingredients from Ely, specifically the type and brand of root beer flavoring determined the blend. Likely the easiest recipe she used included using root beer syrup from the local a and restaurant, which was in business here in Ely until the 1990s. The syrup contained both the flavoring and the sweetener. So by simply adding yeast and lake water, you had a beverage that just needed to ferment for carbonation. The recipe that the museum has on record, shared by Dorothy's great nephew, includes the use of root beer extract and granulated sugar. The brand of extract didn't seem to be as important and much of her grocery orders weren't made by Dorothy. She would send a list back to town with someone, they would bring it to the grocery store and then the grocer would box up whatever was on the list and picked whatever products they had on the shelves at the time. And then another one of Dorothy's angels would go grab the box and bring it on up to Dorothy's the next time they went out. So whatever brand was on the shelf at the time, that's what Dorothy got. But perhaps the most important part of her root beer making process was the fermentation. Not enough and you have a flat yeasty drink and too much and you eventually end up with a drink best available for adults of legal drinking age. In my eight years here at the museum, I have heard hundreds of reviews of Dorothy's original root beer from it was delicious to it was absolutely atrocious. And as simple as Dorothy's recipe was, there were pitfalls that could lead to a terrible bottle of root beer for anybody. Proper sanitation is a key element to ensuring a tasty brew. Not washing the bottles thoroughly can lead to what's referred to as an infection in your brew. Bacteria or other unintended foreign bodies can be digested by the yeast and result in a foul smell or taste. In some cases, the yeast might even begin consuming dead yeast cells. And in this process called autolysis, it can create this sulfur-ish smell and or taste. And clearly Dorothy did have a sanitation process, but when you're brewing and processing upwards of 12,000 bottles annually, there's bound to be a few stinkers in that group. But regardless, the anticipation of an ice cold root beer kept cold on months old blocks of ice harvested from Knife Lake was invigorating when paddling miles over water and slapping black flies and mosquitoes over rods of portages, the idea of what it would taste like, cooling and hydrating the parched mouth on a hot day, the reward for weathering an early July storm, squatting on your PFD far from any possible lightning rod of a tree. It was the cherry on top for many a canoeist boundary waters trip. 
Dorothy recruited and maintained an army of helpers in her 34 years of home brewing. Summer relatives, in fact, her two great nephews, Steve and Dan, would spend their summers with Aunt Dot and help with the unending list of tasks that needed to be done at Dorothy's Wilderness Homestead. However, she would take help where she could get it, as long as it was actually helpful. Even with a sometimes wildly inconsistent product, Dorothy's root beer touched a conservative estimate of 100,000 people. Regardless of the flavor review, the memories of having the privilege of meeting Dorothy in that process has always been 100% positive. And this speaks volumes to the impact that Dorothy had on these visitors and the influence and inspiration she continues to have on them as they share their stories with us here at the museum. The connection through her root beer is why the museum still produces its own version with a proprietary recipe based on Dorothy's best bottle of root beer. For over a decade, the Dorothy's Isle of Pines root beer product has been brewed, bottled, and packaged at Gray Brewing Company, our contract brewer in Janesville, Wisconsin. This family-owned and operated craft brewery and tap room works with many small businesses like ours to create a custom brewed beverage product. They take great care in ensuring the highest quality products and assist in selecting the best quality ingredients. For example, Several years ago, Gray's alerted us to the fact that unless explicitly instructed, a commercial beverage producer can substitute various beverage sweeteners in a cost savings measure without technically having to change the label on the bottle. And that information was invaluable. And at that moment, we decided as an organization to make the commitment with Gray's to always use cane sugar as our sweetener in Dorothy's Isle of Pines root beer, which if you are not aware, the cane sugar industry is incredibly volatile and we could have a whole nother presentation just on the sugar industry, but that would be, I think, much less entertaining and way above me. So we'll, we'll bypass that for now. And not only does Gray's produce our root beer, but they also store most of our packaging inventory for free, which is an incredible in-kind donation that the Gray family makes to the Dorothy Moulter Museum. Dorothy's Isle of Pines root beer is the biggest revenue generator for the museum and provides the necessary funds to support general operations, such as utilities, maintenance, and payroll, the basic needs of any business or organization. It's also the most effective vehicle to transport the story of Dorothy Moulter to the masses. Of course, visitation to the museum is our number one goal, to have people immersed in her life through exploration of her historic cabins. But when they can't come to us, we got to go to them. Our root beer is distributed throughout the Ely area, in stores, at resorts and camps, and served at most restaurants, helping to drive traffic to the museum in many cases. And here at the museum, we store a good amount of root beer in our basement. And that's what this picture up on the screen right now is. We also distribute outside of the Ely area, into the Iron Range, to the North Shore of Lake Superior in the twin ports of Duluth and Superior, Wisconsin in the Twin Cities metro area, the Central Lakes region of Brainerd Baxter and north to Grand Rapids and even International Falls. Our root beer is considered um, often a seasonal beverage. So outside of the, the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, it's not usually on the shelves year round in grocery stores, but many specialty shops and restaurants carry it all year long. And all a business has to do is ask their local distributor for it if they're interested in carrying it or contact us directly. Our biggest limitation on distribution is storage and transport. Even with that, we've had our root beer shipped to Idaho, Illinois, and even Ontario, Canada to root beer specialty shops that wanted to get their hands on not just the root beer, but the incredible story behind it, the story of the root beer lady. This past year has been a breath of fresh air. 
We still experience challenges to doing business, like the great glass shortage of July 2021, but we persevered. And a huge part of our success is due in part to the dedicated staff and volunteer board of directors that contribute their time, skills, knowledge to making the museum better every day. And I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge their investment and my sincere gratitude. To the staff members, Lisa Robbins, Lynn Walsh, Kay Vandervoort, Lily Ortloff, Shauna Butler, and Joe Johnson, this season would not have been as successful without your positive attitudes, your collaborative energy, and your dedicated work ethic. And to our volunteer board of directors, Chair Pam Broomfelt, Vice Chair Gil Knight, Treasurer Secretary Sherry Apps, Butch Deeslin, Liz Gorilla, Alyssa Nelson, Pam Meskin, and Trudy Stobitz. Each one of you contribute your time, your skills, and your energy to ensure the staff have tools available to operate the museum and provide guidance and feedback to continuously improve the organization. These people are the backbone of the Dorothy Moulter Museum. Dorothy's legacy lives on because this group of staff and volunteers is and continues to be inspired by her impact on themselves and on others. We're also really fortunate to have relationships outside of the museum that create opportunities for collaboration. These partnerships allow the museum to fulfill its mission in diverse and unique ways. For example, working with Vermilion Community College directly manifests our vision of inspiring the next generation of Northwood stewards by working with young adults seeking the skills experiences and education to be environmental educators and natural resource managers. Last fall, Vermilion's Garden Club found a donated canoe and soil for a new perennial garden by our museum welcome sign. Last week, we hosted students taking coursework on environmental interpretation during our whirlwind event which is a family-friendly winter-themed community event where students have to research and develop a winter activity station and then share information with our visitors. And then today, we had students in a forest management class implementing step one of a new forest prescription to increase the health and diversity of the Joseph Roseman Memorial Forest where the museum is located. Other collaborations include our brand new Dog Sled to Dorothy's program. We're working with local mushing outfit, Hauling Dogs LLC, to offer an immersive winter experience in the Boundary Waters with an emphasis on ice fishing. And our women's canoe trip offered every June in partnership with Ely Outfitting Company. Stay tuned for dates for next year because this year's trip is already booked full. But both programs offer an opportunity for folks to visit Knife Lake and Dorothy's beloved Isle of Pines with no previous experience required. And let's not forget you guys, all of you here tonight, your presence here is an indication that you have a relationship with the museum and with Dorothy's legacy. We could not continue to operate and strive to inspire others with Dorothy's story without your support. And clearly this isn't a picture of all of you. It's a stock photo from Zoom that I found just for emphasis. Now, before we move on to the big drawing, um, I'd like to take a moment to see if there are any questions that need to be addressed. I did see some come in. Um, so if Alyssa, do you have any questions that, that didn't get answered? Not on my side of it. My Q&A is empty. I've just been putting some stuff in chat for people. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to type in the chat box that we can address? Oh, you guys are, you guys are an easy audience. Now, if you think of something after the program, 
um, that you would like to um, discuss further or questions that you have, I am more than happy to um, give you a call or correspond over email. So um, I do have my contact information here. It's just at ripyourlady.com. We also have um, our social media um, sites here where we've got um, a lot of different people looking at it. And interestingly enough, especially on our Facebook page, um, we have a lot of followers that knew Dorothy or are related to Dorothy. And so if the museum doesn't have an exact answer for a question, a lot of times people will chime in um, with their own personal experiences or, um, you know, what they know of Dorothy's life. So with that being said, I know that some of you here tonight are canoe raffle ticket holders and because they're green, it's uh, picking it up as a green screen, so you won't be able to actually see what's on the ticket. Um, but we have been mixing this up periodically throughout the day. Um, we did get one letter in the mail today, made it just in time for raffle tickets. Um, if you sent any um, funds through the mail and haven't seen an email or a letter come back saying that we received it, uh, we will contact you if it comes in tomorrow. And this is the drawing for our 17 foot Winona Spirit 2 canoe with portage yoke and paths. Okay. Now, please know if you don't win, 100% of your raffle ticket purchase supports the Dorothy Moulter Museum. Okay, here we go. Ticket number 571. First name, Robin. Area code, phone number 612. So if you are ticket holder 571, congratulations. I will be calling you after the webinar. Um, and if uh, the person who won is not here, um, I call and generally need to leave a message because who answers unknown phone, call, phone calls these days? Um, but I usually get a call back within a few minutes. So I give them a few days and try to reach out again. Um, we've never had someone not call back. So don't get your hopes up on a redraw. Anyways, with that being said, um, I would just like to say it's been um, a joy and a pleasure preparing this program. Um, it's a part of Dorothy's life that gets a lot of attention, but not kind of the deep dive into history that we did tonight. So it was a lot of fun for me. I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Um, your presence tonight just confirms that Dorothy has and will continue to inspire those who know her story. And thank you for your support and for your attention tonight. And it is 744. You have 16 minutes to go visit our online silent auction before it closes. And I wish you all the best of luck. Take care and good night.